Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me just put my timer on so that I want to exceed the time. Uh, all right. Excellent. Um, one of the important things about the uh, nation state law um, that was enacted in July 2018 is, in fact, in preparation for the Israeli state to deal with Jewish minority rule. Finally, the Israeli government has realized that Jews have again become a minority in um, the entire area ruled by Israel, historical Palestine, um, a situation in which they found themselves in when they began the colonization of the, when the Zionist movement began the colonization of the country. And despite a number of efforts to, for demographic change through ethnic cleansing and expulsions, especially in 48 and 67, the situation today stands with a majority Palestinian population of about 7.5 million uh, Palestinians with a smaller Jewish population of less than 7 million. And this is, of course, subject to the kinds of uh, questionable censuses that the Israeli government usually conducts. Um, there is no way for Israel, at least as far as it can tell, to change those demographics in the near future. And therefore, this law was, in fact, legislating um, for the future of Israel um, as a Jewish minority rule where Jews will be in every aspect of the law, every part of the law, and state running will be privileged racially and religiously over non-Jews. But let me give you a background to this nation state law, which is the culmination of the Israeli attempts at uh, uh, colonizing Palestine and at uh, granting um, uh, Jews special privileges and transforming the demographics. Much of this, in fact, goes back to the 19th century, um, especially, and here modernization, I think, was uh, a problem for the Palestinians. The Ottomans introduced in 1858 uh, land privatization law across the Ottoman Empire. It is this law which enabled several colonial forces to come in and begin to purchase uh, land in Palestine. Many of the small peasants who lived in villages were too scared to register uh, land in their names uh, for fear of taxation and also of sending their children to military service. And as a result, big landowners began to acquire this, and the Zionist movement came in and began to purchase land. What is interesting is that usually Palestinians and historians speak of the expulsion of the Palestinians and the beginning of the demographic change in the country only in 1948. This is actually inaccurate. Um, the legal expulsion begins in the 1880s. Once the Zionists, in fact, acquired the land and began to colonize the land, they would purchase whole tracts of land with Palestinian villagers who live on them and then proceed to expel the entire Palestinian villagers and take over their villages and land. So initially, Initially, we begin to see a legal form of expulsion um, on a smaller scale than what would happen later. By the time the British come in in 1917, the British begin to, in fact, um, endow the Zionist movement with Palestinian public lands, but also they enacted an important law in 1925 called the Palestinian Citizenship Law. And this law immediately denationalized upwards of 40,000 Palestinians who are, in fact, expats living in Europe in the Americas and were, who were given less than six months or so to come back and claim Palestinian citizenship. At the time in 1925, it was difficult to travel back from Chile or Guatemala within six months to do this. So tens of thousands of Palestinians, a conservative estimate puts them at about 40,000 who lost their nationality. And the law, of course, made it easier for Jewish colonists to come into the country in the name of immigration. Remember, settler colonists love the term immigrants. They claimed themselves as immigrants to a country. Um, this is what the, you know, the, the, the European settlers of the Americas call themselves usually Usually, um, or to Australia, or to New Zealand, or Canada, and but also to Palestine. That's what happened um, historically. In 47-48, of course, the major illegal expulsion begins of close to a million Palestinians. And immediately, um, the United Nations, by December of 1948, issues a uh, resolution uh, granting Palestinians, as all refugees, the right to return home. The Israelis, of course, would have none of it. In July 1950, Israel uh, enacted a very important racist law that continues to be in operation today um, called the Law of Return, which grants Jews anywhere in the world the right 
quote unquote, to return to a country from which they did not issue, of course. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the question of return becomes sort of very, very important. And remember the arguments, for example, today, Israel and Zionist propagandists tell us that it is kind of impossible for Palestinians to expect to return to their country after being out of it for 70 years. Yet in the same breath, it tells us that European Jews who are actually converts to Judaism in their majority and do not issue from the ancient Hebrew Hebrews um, can have that right after 2,000 years, right? So it's, it's a kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, oxymoronic presentation of the arguments, but nonetheless, that's what we have. Um, uh, in 1967, it was just revealed, actually, there was some uh, interesting uh, uh, news in the last week about an important fact which was not known to the public, that the Israelis had set up what they called a professor's committee in 1967 to study how to expel further the Palestinian population of the 67 territories. And this also shows you, um, especially in relation to today's BDS, the complete involvement of academics and universities in Israel with the expulsion and the oppression of the Palestinian people. Now, the expulsion you know, continued, as we know, even in, in smaller forms after 48 and after 67. We're in today half the Palestinian people, about 7.5 million people live in exile, and half still live on the land. But the Israelis were unable to expel this other half, which is you know, their problem, and hence the nation state's law, law's importance. At the same time, there was a parallel project for the Israelis. Um, initially, of course, they were shameless, uh, well, the Zionists were shameless about presenting their project as a colonial settler project. They set up what they called the Jewish Colonization Association. Later, it became specific to Palestine, was renamed in 1924 as the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association. They set up a colonial bank called the Jewish Colonial Bank in German, uh, in, in English was translated the Jewish Colonial Trust. So they were quite keen on joining Europe's colonial efforts at that time. However, by the 1930s, with the rise of anti-colonialism, they began to understand that it is not perhaps a good PR to use the colonial uh, uh, vocabulary. And they began to say, well, in fact, we are a national liberation movement who want to liberate European Jewish populations by colonizing someone else's land. And in that sense, we might have set up our state through colonization but not through colonialism. The distinction is important for them often. Um, nonetheless, um, after that, they began to insist that the Palestinians, the victims of their expulsion and their land theft, must recognize their right to exist. Usually in international law, countries uh, can be recognized de jure or de facto as existing, but no country has a right to exist. The Israelis insisted that, in fact, the only condition for any kind of even negotiations with the Arab countries, let alone the Palestinians, must follow a recognition of their right to exist. Then they began to change that. They began to speak even about a so-called Israeli self-determination, which trumps Palestinian self-determination. This would move by 2007 to a much more specific claim. The Israeli prime ministers began to insist that the Palestinians and other Arabs must recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. That is, to exist as a settler colony, but also one that has the right to privilege Jews over non-Jews by law. Israel has upwards of 65 such laws, um, in addition, of course, to its national symbols, its flag, its uh, national anthem, um, its days of uh, weekly uh, uh, holidays. All of that, of course, are exclusive to the Jewish population population who are about you know 78% of proper israel and about you know 47 48% of the entire area ruled by israel and more recently, they've come to us and claimed that, in fact, what they're defending is Jewish self-determination. Not Israeli Jewish self-determination, but Jewish self-determination worldwide. As we know, the majority of Jews, of course, live outside of Israel. They did not elect the Israeli government to speak for them. Many of them either support it, oppose it, or don't care about it. Yet Israel speaks for them and claims to represent their self-determination rights. So, um, the point, of course, of Jewish self-determination and recognizing Israel as a Jewish state is precisely part of the acknowledgement and recognition by the Israeli government that today Israel 
realizes that it will always be a Jewish minority government, and therefore there has to be a legal basis. So whatever liberal democratic facade it had set up for itself in the last 70 years, after expelling the majority of the Palestinian population and establishing a Jewish colonial, colonial majority, that it is in fact liberal and democratic and rules by majority vote, now it realizes this facade has to be dropped, hence the necessity for legislating this law in July 2018 as a, a precursor, all right, as a precursor to a Jewish minority rule, which is the only possible option for it to continue with its project uh, without being able to expel massive numbers of Palestinians. I thank you for listening. And thank you. Thank you very, very much for being the